Let us pray. O Lord, uphold me that I may uplift thee. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Thank you. When God lights a fire, we don't need no matches. When God lights a fire, we don't need no matches. I speak to you in the name of God, His Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. First, I would like to thank your rector, my good friend, Sir Davison Bowie. Parochial Church Council and you, the church family here at St. Luke, for inviting me to participate in this your feast of title. It is my prayer that God will continue to richly bless all of you as you work feverishly in his vineyard. Every year, the church here at St. Luke takes some time to reflect on its Christian journey. And you may very well reflect also on the life and work of your patron Saint Luke. However, I believe that you will agree with me that the emphasis should be directed on how we analyze and measure our church's spiritual growth and development. Now is the time, now is the occasion to stop and reflect on whether we are doing the will of Almighty God or whether we are doing the will of man. My friends, I am in love with the theme for this festival, equipping the saints for ministry and I can let you help me. Equipping the saints for ministry outside the walls. But more importantly, I'm enthused with the gospel reading for tonight. For the gospel reading does not lend itself to the art and profession of fishing. But it explicates to us the very dynamics of Christian conversion and evangelism. We see Simon Peter as having a glimpse of the power and knowledge of Christ as he falls before him in the profound grip of his own sinfulness. But even so, he is called by Christ to become a fisher of men. What St. Luke says to us in his gospel is that God calls us, is that he takes the initiative, but most of the times we are unaware of his call. We become conscious sometimes months, late, years later, when we find ourselves engulfed in the awesomeness of his presence. When we say truly, this must be the hand of God in our lives. St. John reminds us in chapter 15 and verse 16, Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I, but I, ah, and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. Are we equipped to do the work that God has called us to really do? And that is a question. This is a soul-searching question for each and every one who call themselves Christians. What do we really mean by this word, equip? As ushers, do you have a good working knowledge of the church? that you attend? 
In other words, can you respond comfortably to any question being asked of you? Of the church that you worship in? Are you a reflection of the spiritual life of the church? Can visitors feel the warmth and, and love of God radiating through you? As servers of the sanctuary, and chalice assistance. The sanctuary is not an unusual place for you to be, but can you say that you are worthy of being there? Can you say that you are a part of that sacred experience called the Eucharist? Are you a dedicated and committed people to the service of Almighty God? And as you ponder upon these serious questions, St. Luke reminds us that before we can go out into all the world and preach the gospel, that before we can attempt to evangelize others, that we ourselves need to be quick to be converted by Almighty God. That we, like Simon Peter, must experience the reality of a spiritual conversion. Earlier we said that God calls us. And so if he calls us, it is only logical to believe that he would equip us. That make sense? That he would empower us with his gifts to do his will. But how does, does God go about doing that? So Luke interprets our theme, our theme for tonight by saying that to be equipped, one has to be converted by God. That when God reveals himself to us, when he calls us, when we are confronted by the awesomeness of God's presence, automatically we humble ourselves and in this act of humility we confess before the power of Almighty God. This conversion, God's call, God's presence in your Christian experience occurs at different stages in your Christian journey. In essence, conversion is a continuing process. Many of us believe that to be equipped, we must be theologians. We must be church historians. We must hold leading positions in church organizations. We must be heard and seen by others just like the Pharisees. If this is our interpretation of being equipped, then what is the church doing to confront the social ills that gradually erodes our society? With this understanding, why are we afraid of removing ourselves from our comfort zones and casting our nets into the deep where the catch might be more bounteous. Evangelism means different things to different people. And the very word over time has come to suggest for many people the conventional mass evangelists who engineers convergence by intimidation and emotional manipulation, often for financial and always for egotistical gain. My friends, it suggests a sense of entrapment. There is no indication of the free will that we know about. Many who were once converted by the manipulative kind of evangelism have felt they were trapped into a psychological straitjacket that repressed their freedom and personality. 
And from which they later found it extremely hard to free themselves, usually abandoning the Christian faith altogether. My friends in Christ, that when you walk to that altar under redress, that you are converted. If you believe that, that you are saved, that you are fully equipped, it is a joke. We are aware of some of these people, even those who have departed from the Anglican faith. But what is our understanding of this experience called conversion? For many of us came up in that environment, that culture where we walk to the altar because of fear. On the other hand, we may very well say we were baptized and confirmed in the Anglican faith. And so that should equip us to be fishers of men. Let's ask ourselves a question. Is it really happening? Are we being effective in bringing others to Christ? And that is a question for the church universe. Are we being effective in bringing others in the church who may be not in our status quo to Christ? Who may be not in our social standing? Are we bringing them to Christ? Or are we surviving off of this word called in <sighs> Anglicanism? Where is the spirituality in our communion? I dare say that we practice church and try to fool around with God. But if we are true to ourselves, let us start searching for the spirituality. My friends in Christ, those who we believe are beyond our walls will say to us if and when we confront them, you come to me with your doctrines, but I cannot feel the presence of God coming through you. If you say that you are in oneness, with this Jesus. And that is why St. Luke says that to be equipped, you must be converted. It is a, a personal experience between you and Almighty God. For when you answer this call, life can never be the same again. Peter had already seen something of Jesus. For Jesus had visited his house and healed his mother-in-law. He had already heard some of Jesus' teachings, though we do not know what. In essence, Peter had a knowledge of this Jesus, just like some of us. But did he had an intimate relationship with Jesus is another matter. In the real world, Peter's reaction in this story is realistic. After having toiled a whole day and, and catching nothing, being exhausted and disappointed, no one could convince me about any miraculous catch of fish. I believe that most of us would respond the same way. He's talking foolishness. However, this is not a someone. This is not a rabbi. This is not just some miracle worker. In short, what St. Luke is saying to us is that if there was a conversion experience before, if Peter had already experienced the presence and touch of God in his life, that he would become aware or conscious of the fruits of the Spirit working through him. Especially the one that we speak so much about, 
call faith. See, Luke's understanding of God in this context is that God reveals himself to us in some of our most troubling times. And he expects that we will be opened up to the power of his presence, which will transform us into what he wants us to be. For the new God's presence humbles us and forces us to acknowledge our transgressions. The miraculous catch is indeed the very essence of the conversion experience. Something changed in Peter's perception. And he began to see something of who and what Jesus really is. A self-revelation of Almighty God. Peter's reaction will be understood by most Christians who have shared this experience of suddenly feeling the reality of Jesus' presence. The awesomeness and the awareness not only of seeing but of being seen in turn. My friends in Christ, being equipped, being converted, starts with God calling us and we responding to that call by acknowledging our wretchedness, coming to terms with our sins and repenting of them before Almighty God. It is the dominant theme in St. Luke's Gospel that Jesus comes to call not the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Repentance, therefore, must precede conversion. And so it is appropriate that repentance precedes the call of Peter. My friends, it's about letting God take the initiative in revealing himself to us, thus transforming our lives and enabling us to grow through the works of his Holy Spirit. In most Christian lives, there are many convergences. As God shapes us into what he wants us to be. No doubt at some point, there must be such a conversion experience for every Christian. But to try to manufacture it in others is a terrible blasphemy. Only God's spirit can do it. And the spirit blows where it builds. My friends in Christ, if we truly experience God's presence in our lives, if we truly experience God's transforming touch and power, then we must be ever cognizant that mission is first the work of Christ himself. That God converts us, equips us, and sends us out to do his will. Our various Damascus experiences are all engineered and are propelled through the work of God's Holy Spirit. If we are driven by God's Spirit, then our ministry must not be limited to the four walls of this church. If we are not conscious of our conversion, then we will continue to do church and to play church. But are we truly representatives of the body of Christ? We practice a Christianity that excludes the very people that Jesus embraced. If we are converted or equipped, then all humanity must be seen as one. If we are sharing in the love of God, if we are a part of this love and his love, then it must manifest itself in our actions and in our behavior. Are we modeling the attitude of Jesus in reaching out to the poor and the underprivileged? I dare say that the church is very far from modeling such an attitude. That is partly because many parts of the church prefer to dispense law instead 
of grace. My friends, when we intimately experience God's intervention in our lives, when we give ourselves in humility to God, God works his purpose out in our lives. We no longer see Jew or Greek, but we come to recognize that we are all children of the one God that we believe in. Being equipped, being converted, being called by God, we are given the spiritual tools to intervene into the lives of those who we once discarded. We no longer construct walls that prevent others from experiencing the love of Christ in their lives. But sharing in God's love enables us to break down those walls that we constructed and through his spirit manifest that peace that passeth all understanding and share with them in that joy which is unspeakable and full of glory. If you have constructed walls, if you are guilty of preventing others from sharing in the love of God, now is the time to empty ourselves before Almighty God. As you reflect on the answers to those initial questions, and as you bring your imperfections and our imperfections before Almighty God, experience the awesomeness of his presence. Experience the power of his touch as he calls us and equips us to share his gospel beyond the four walls of our churches where we will be able to rescue the perishing and to pray for the dying. But it is when we allow God to break down our barriers that we, with an abundance of confidence, will be able to sing for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, to all generations, forever and ever.